uh, the panel discussion, I think all of you would have, you know, seen in the agenda, how can behavioral science really help um, in solving societal challenges? Can it help and how? But uh, before I really set the premise for the topic, uh, a brief introduction of all the four speakers uh, here. I know all of you already know everything about them, but I still have to list out their achievements. Um, uh, first of all, Professor Gerd uh, Gigrin, thank you so much for making it to the second edition of the Winter School at Tapni Manipal. Great to have you. Uh, we also managed to get an interview with him earlier today, which we will be playing on ET now. So hopefully more people will start using heuristics after that. So uh, Professor Gerd, as you all know, is the director of the Harding Center for Risk Literacy at the Max Planck Institute of Human Development, Berlin, Germany. He's former professor of psychology at the University of Chicago and the John M. Olin Distinguished Visiting Professor, School of Law at the University of Virginia. He's also Batten Fellow at the Darden Business School, University of Virginia, and Fellow of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and the German Academy of Sciences. He's trained US uh, federal judges, German physicians, and top managers in decision-making and understanding risks and uncertainties. He won the American Association for the Advancement of Science Prize for the Best Article in Behavioral Sciences and the Association of American Publishers Prize for the Best Book in the Social and Behavioral Sciences. The Google Scholar page records 636 published articles. That includes eight books, research articles, press articles, and his first article dates back to 1977. Phew, I'm running out of breath. <laughs> he has around 57,570 citations for all his scientific work. And um, apart from all this, here are some fun facts about uh, Professor Gerd. Uh, he was a jazz and Dixieland musician. He was part of the Munich B. Peters Dixieland Band, which performed in a TV ad for the uh, Volkswagen Golf around the time it came out in uh, 1974 and um, he also mentioned uh, to the people at TAPME that he has a fancy for snakes <coughs> and he spent a month in South Africa to get trained in catching pythons. Uh, I don't know if the you know Manipal area, it the Mangalore <laughs> area <laughs> will allow you to indulge in that hobby but I hope you do it after this uh, panel discussion and you know maybe you can show them what you found tomorrow when I'm not there. So um, the person sitting next to Professor, of course, is someone who all of you are familiar with, Professor Madhubi Raghavan, uh, PhD in finance in 2002 from Griffith University, Queensland. He moved to the University of Auckland Business School in 2003 as a senior lecturer in finance. In 2005, he moved to Monash University, Melbourne as an associate professor and became the head of finance department in January 2006. In 2008, he was promoted to full professorship in tenure, one of the youngest full professors at Monash University. And he was also awarded the VC's gold medal for team teaching excellence at Monash University. Uh, he moved to Tapmi Manipal in June 2013. And uh, some fun facts about him. Um, he runs physically every day for around uh, eight kilometers. Do you also make the faculty do that? <laughs> okay. They make you run, okay. While running, he thinks of new projects, ideas, and most of his weather-related and culture projects were conceived on the running track. Amazing, okay. So on my left, I have uh, Dr. Konstantinos uh, Katsikopoulos. He's currently the associate professor at the Southampton Business School. Uh, he was previously a visiting assistant professor at MIT and the deputy director of the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. He works on integrating standard decision theory with the simple rules of thumb people actually use. He's engaged with government and business on problems characterized by complexity, uncertainty in economics, management, and health. He's also collaborated with a, paint, uh, with a painter by exchanging letters on how people actually make decisions. And eventually, they also had a joint art exhibition in the Satellite Berlin Gallery. Uh, besides all this, he also mentions he's enjoying carrot halwa at Manipal. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Finally, we have uh, Biju Dominic. He's the CEO and co-founder of Final Mile Consulting, a Chicago and Mumbai-based consulting firm. 
final mile is the first firm in the world to use learning from cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics to understand and influence human behavior. Um, they've used their unique approach in influencing human behavior to reduce road accidents. We'd love to hear more about that on the panel. Um, mitigate teenage pregnancy, increase use of toilets, mitigate girl trafficking, etc. Um, he's delivered lectures at all the top B schools in the world. He's been published in some of the top business newspapers in India. And uh, he says that right from his student days, he had a rebellious streak that questioned the status quo. I hope that streak will continue on the panel. You can question all of them on all their beliefs. And he continues to enjoy questioning the status quo. Okay. So that's about the four speakers. Um, now about, uh, you know, the premise for this entire panel, which is how can behavioral science help with dealing with societal challenges? Um, so as we see it today, there are two problems. Um, the first problem is uh, that we expect people, uh, you know, who are intelligent, knowledgeable, that they will make rational choices because economics expects that people, you know, will make rational choices, but we don't see that happening every day. So you would have doctors who are fully aware of the ills of smoking who smoke. You have people who are aware of, uh, you know, road accidents who refuse to wear helmets, who do not wear seat belts. As a society, we know war is bad, but countries still go to war. So the first problem is that people do not make uh, rational choices, you know, despite being educated, despite being knowledgeable. The second problem is the uh, overemphasis that we place on data and rationality itself. Um, is data and rational, rationality the answer to all our problems? If that was the case, we wouldn't have, you know, so many crises in the banking sector. I mean, they have some of the best algorithms, some of the most sophisticated financial modeling for the, going for them. Despite that, we've had crises. And, uh, you know, despite having such advanced modeling, people couldn't predict Trump's victory. People thought demonetization would be a disaster for Prime Minister Modi, but that did not happen. So the second problem being with rationality and reason itself. So looking at these two problems, how are we going to solve societal challenges like education, illiteracy, improving access to finance? Um, is there a better way of doing it? Can behavioral sciences really help where rationality can't? Because behavioral sciences actually looks at, uh, you know, human beings as hum humane. They don't look at them as machines. And um, it also has two implications. It assumes that human beings are fallible, so um, that the decisions people make are constrained by cognitive limitations, time constraints, and that human beings are also adaptive, that we live in a very complex world, so we are used to making you know, decisions by gut, decision by instinct. So that's why this, the premise of this whole panel, can behavioral sciences really help where rational models haven't? And I'm going to get all my speakers to really give us opening remarks on this. Professor Gerd, your own thoughts on how can behavioral science really help in solving societal challenges? Yeah. Behavioral science can help in many ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, first, on your first problem, that um, so people don't make rational choices like doctors smoke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, the first remark is, Rational choice theory says nothing about that. It's only about consistency, and if a doctor consistently smokes, he's okay and rational. <laughs> so the first start is we have the wrong emphasis in rational choice theory. And the big problem we're facing is not that people are fallible. We are all fallible, but the rational models are fallible. Right. That's the problem. And we need to have a behavioral theory that has what we call ecological rationality, so that tells us what is working in the world. Hmm. So, um, the, and the overemphasis on data, as you observed, is truly a problem in algorithms. We do have, particularly in California, uh, semi-intellectuals who believe that hmm. we are soon be replaced by algorithms. <laughs> I don't have that fear. If you ever worked with deep neural networks, or uh, in Berlin we have um, a group that tries to get cars driving by themselves. Hmm? The head of this group 
has changed the name from artificial intelligence to artificial dumbness <laughs> because it's very hard to teach these algorithms. Yeah. So I think we can be safely sure that we will be, will be around for a long time. Our, our jobs are safe. Hmm? Our jobs are safe. Not all. Uh, very, uh, yeah, certain jobs can be done by algorithms. But the claim is almost everything. And that's not possible. Unless the algorithms kill all humans, then they can live their own lives. So. <laughs> that's the same thing that uh, autonomous driving will work as long as there's as, as no human drivers on the road and on Autobahn. My impression from India driving here, you have a long time <laughs> <laughs> to uh, get in this problem. Right. So. Your, your own thoughts on this. Can you hear me? Okay. So let me just start with um, an interesting statement by Dan Ariely. He said, human beings are irrational but predictably irrational. <laughs> right? So there's a very interesting paper by Huberman and Regev. It's a 2001 Journal of Finance paper. I'm, I'm an academic, so I have to cite some good papers. So in this paper, they show there's a company called um, Untramed. It's a company that produces cancer drugs. And the cure for this cancer was documented five months before in science. And this company republished the results again, and the stock price went up 600%. Everybody knew this, this drug was found. So obviously, the, if the markets were efficient, the markets should not have responded. This is a republication of the same news. So from $12, it went up to $85, and then close to $30 on Monday, stayed at $30 for three weeks. Clearly shows that we violated the efficient market hypothesis because dissemination of information happened, the prices should have responded, and therefore, republication should have no impact. This is a standard classical, traditional finance, as we call it. Behavioral finance, on the other hand, looks at the integration of psychological principles and tries to explain why this happened, as opposed to just stopping at it happened. So if this is an anomaly, can I explain the anomaly? How do I explain the anomaly? Is it an overconfidence, whatever sort of bias it is? How do we explain it? Let's just look at a very interesting paper by Lugi Zingales. The paper is called does finance benefit society? Now here Chandra has given a topic as behavioral science dealing with societal challenges. If you read this paper, you'd be so worried as a finance academic and for somebody who wants to enter the finance industry, it is damning. It literally slaps the finance profession and says 57% of the Americans think that finance guys have destroyed the society. This is a big number. And it's a very inflated perception that fin professors and financial economists have of the industry. I'm not directly answering Chandra's question, but I'm giving some opening remarks about how there's a clear distinction between what we are used to teaching students, which is called traditional finance, standard finance, modern finance, and what we now know also as a completely different discipline, which looks at psychological principles, biases, and that can explain why some of these problems are happening. I'll give you one example before I pass it over to you. Americans, like anybody else, would love to own a house, a home, right? Every American wanted to own a home, and every bank in the US made it so easy for Americans to buy a home. Just imagine the number of foreclosures. Imagine how many Americans lost jobs, how many Americans lost their livelihood, how many Americans lost their houses. Between, I think, 2003 to 2008, the property prices went up 85%. And in 2008, it dropped by well over 30%. A lot of Americans lost everything due to the subprime crisis. And that is a result of greed and fear and lots of emotions playing around. I'm guessing we'll have some chance to discuss those yeah. during the course of the panel discussion. Thank you. Your opening thoughts. So I, I also don't believe that we should be very worried about algorithms and models yet. So I think we should all be quite happy with the way we can understand the world and adapt to the world. We've been here in, in, in Manipal only two days, and as Chandra already mentioned, it took me about two hours to figure out that I really like carrot halva. <laughs> and ever since, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. The others also have similar stories. Uh, we, we have been in, you know, in this planet for a while, and things, as far as I understand, from what I know from history, they're always getting better. 
The thing is we also got more ambitious, I think. So we want better health, we want more fairness, we want everybody to enjoy everything that we have achieved. And this could be some kind of leap that we need to, uh, to, to achieve, to, to be able to make this leap. And it's actually also true that currently it's not clear how to do it. We need the, I don't think mathematics or formal thinking is exactly the way to go because it's an issue of context and mathematics is basically context-free, cannot model context. So we somehow need some kind of breakthrough and the first place to look for the breakthrough is our own thinking and how we can uh, develop it and perhaps the thinking of other organisms and phenomena in the natural world. But we, we're probably very far from having excellent ideas about how to do it. But personally, it seems to me looking into behavior is more promising than looking into logic. Okay. Did you want to be in? Uh, <coughs> Although I'm a practitioner for the last 10 years and using behavioral sciences for changing and, and, and making the world a better place, uh, let me begin with two factors as to why, why I believe it won't be easy for behavioral sciences to step in to solve the problems of the world. One, because traditionally for, not for decades, we had the rational approach uh, the, based on the rational man as the, the epicenter of all our strategies of dealing with uh, our problems in our society. Now, overnight you're trying to tell them that, you know, even remind them that your failure rate is very, very large including you tell any leading marketing company in the world that your failure rate of new products continue to be 90%. It's, it's a truth, but you know that none of them are accepting it. They all continue to do the same way because uh, Thomas Kuhn had told us long back that as soon as a paradigm shift comes in, is nobody is going to accept a paradigm shift. Uh, the more intelligent you are, the more intelligent the reasons each of us will come up with as to why the status quo is the right way of doing things. So I can reassure you that behavioral sciences, GERD and others have come up with extremely good theories, but it's not going to be easily accepted by the practicing people. That's one big reason. The second reason is, you know, human behavior comes out from the most complex thing in the whole universe, which is the human brain. And when we say, I can solve uh, a human behavior problem using behavioral sciences, we are saying that I can understand human behavior very well. Now, that's not easy. For example, one of the first problems that we worked as an organization was the biggest cause of death in Mumbai city. And the biggest cause of Mumbai city is, uh, as people in Bombay and thousands cross the railway tracks on a regular basis, 12 to 15 people people die every day in Bombay as they cross the railway tracks. Now, you go to a place where accidents happen and you say, Why could, how can an accident happen? Because you can see a train coming in almost for, you know, almost a kilometer away. Now, who needs to be told in Bombay that if you get hit by that train, you will die? But why are people dying? It took my team six months to understand that the reason why they're getting hit by a train is because of a deficiency in their brain. Because evolutionarily, we haven't seen large objects move fast. Elephants and giraffes never moved fast. We are very good in judging the speed of small objects. But when a large object comes, we underestimate the speed of a large object by close to 40%. Now this is just one example to say that the problems out there that you see, people are driving fast, people are taking drugs, people are, you know, uh, defecating in the open, people are not paying taxes, they are being corrupt. It is not an easy to decipher as to why they do what they do. And unless we are able to do that, we are not going to solve it. But the, the good thing is that the, 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 the solutions for deciphering the problem will come from behavioral sciences. And only behavioral sciences can help decipher. So I don't want to talk about an immediate change that will happen, but the future belongs to the behavioral sciences. Uh, Professor, Kirk, you want to comment on that? That, you know, he, he's saying that all this is great in theory, but changes will not happen overnight. It will take a long time. Are you... Um, 
I fear it's right that it will take time, but let's start with ourselves, academics. There was a financial crisis. As Maru said, uh, there was greed, but there was also a certain theory of finance, which was not the solution to the crisis, but part of the problem. And for instance, uh, there is the idea that a complex situation, like the financial world, so for the regulators who are supposed to you know, take care, uh, the idea was we need complex solutions. Hmm. And that's a big error. And we could have that insight that's well documented. You can show this statistically, you just use your common sense. Huh? Uh, in, and, but still we have uh, models like value at risk you know, that involve computations of thousands of risk factors of millions of uh, correlations and so on, and which are not the solution. It's part of the problem. So, uh, Tapney could start. So all of you could start a revolution. Stop teaching Markowitz Stop teaching Merton. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm saying that. Hmm? And we are not just talking about the other people down on the street, huh? who, which is a problem certainly, who get caught here. Yeah? But it starts in academia. Hmm? And uh, so I repeat something that I've said before in small circles. You are a small university. And Madhu is doing his best, offering you incentives hmm, to attract you to do good research. That's a good step, but it's not enough. You need to have your own vision. If you go on imitating MIT or Harvard, you will not be known in history. You need to get a vision, a new vision, and follow that. And if you do finance, it's obvious what the new vision could be. So look at real traders, they don't do Markowitz, they don't do these other models, they, they're useless. Hmm. Oh, I feel like the little child in the story, but, yeah. <laughs> but it's true. Hmm. And so you could develop an alternative theory. Hmm. And that could be, for instance, a heuristic theory. Traders use heuristics. So. Uh, the uh, last year, I had lots of contact with a billionaire who started with zero, had, who is, is a wealth manager. He manages his own wealth. He has a single heuristic, which is hmm, uh, borrow money from low interest countries and invest only in high interest countries. So basically, invest in Africa, in other things. Yeah? So according to financial theory, the theory that you teach, hmm, he could not make money. And he's so upset about financial theory that he wanted to create an entire institute for heuristics and finance. You could do that here. And people would hear about that. And you would have allies, not just us. Nassim Talib might come and be happy. Hmm? Many others would be happy, all the traders, all the others. And you could start a revolution. So that's a message and not just about people outside. If I'm here next year again, I will ask you again, who dared? And Madhu will hold his hand over you. And if your papers will not be published in the Journal of Finance, there is a good chance. <laughs> and every revolution takes its time. But it takes people who have a vision, an intellectual vision, but also people of the courage, who are not short-sighted, the plan in the long way. Right. That's my remark. Right. Which brings me to my next question uh, to Madhu. Uh, how do you really reconcile complex financial models that you teach in your finance class to insights from behavioral finance and economics? Yeah. So, God has actually answered some of my questions. So, this complex financial models. Uh, let's let's look at a couple of things. So the idea of behavioral finance came from Keynes in 1936 first. He said that optimism would lead to booms and bursts in the markets. And then him and Minsky went the other side and said, you do too many innovation, it's going to destroy 
capitalism. When we teach a Markowitz or a Sharp or a Merton model, unfortunately, what's going to happen is it's going to be very difficult, as Biju rightly pointed out, to quickly replace those models. In a class setting, for instance, you would not find a single textbook, Chandra and others, that will cover, if you pick an investments textbook or, or a fin textbook, you'll have some 500 pages for all of this classical models, and you'll probably have five pages dealing with behavioral finance. Hmm. So it's almost impossible for me to say, let's discard Sharp, Markowitz, Merton, and all of these people uh, completely. I don't think we'll be able to do that. What we can surely do is probably have a fin course, and it's very important, it's a really important question, and Gerd actually answered to some extent by looking at the heuristics angle. So what we need to do is we need to be able to expose the students to multiple perspectives. So we've got to be able to tell them, hey, this is how standard classical finance works. Let's take the two crises. I want to take the dot-com bubble, and I want to take the subprime crisis. Both of them were big crises, right? What was so different in the subprime crisis that did not happen in the dot-com bubble? Why didn't all the banks fail in 2001? Why did they fail in 2008? I will tell you why. All the banks were exposed to all this complex financial products in 2008. Banks were not exposed to those stocks in 2001. Now, when you go to a class, we equate all of these crises. The East crises are not the same. They're very different. So when you're going to teach a finance course, you've got to be able to absolutely expose this. It's like a Kuninian paradigm shift. These are completely two different paradigms. And you have to tell, in fact, we are probably one of the very few schools in the country that run a course in behavioral finance. May not be the extent that Gerd is imagining, but I, I think that day is not very far where we will probably have series of courses, bringing in a, a neuroscientist, bringing in a physicist, bringing in a biologist, and trying to understand this. Sure, sure. So definitely it's possible. But remember that all of these guys, the students who are here and, and every business school, they want to be employable. So for them, their question is, hey, have I learned how to discount a cash flow? Have I learned how to do a shop's capital surprising model? Have I learned how to do a Markowitz portfolio theory? We have to do that. But we also have to tell them that markets are not rational. Markets are not efficient. They are only partly efficient. If you asked Gene Pharma today how efficient a market is between 0 to 100, Gene Pharma would have said 100 20 years ago. Today he will say it's not even 80. He will say that. Why would Dan Kahneman in 2002 and Richard Thurler last year win the Nobel in, for their work, which is completely opposite to what the Shops, the Lintners, the Mertons, the Millers, the Modiglianis of the world have done? So surely there's a clearly receptive feeling that this is a discipline that needs to be encouraged. And for faculty, for professors who are working in this area, it's a really difficult game because most top journals are not fully convinced that this can, still be, this can still be published. So again, there's a tenure problem for a faculty. So your question is more about how do we reconcile. It's tough to reconcile, but it's not impossible. For a faculty, how do you get tenure? So if you go back to Gerd's point on Harvard, MIT, and if you want to replicate those stuff, you look at how many of those profs even do behavioral work? Very few. Right. Right. So there are serious issues. I have a comment on Madhu. Sure. Hmm? And the, so, uh, the question on how to teach. Hmm? And uh, I think um, I do not mean that you should not teach uh, Markowitz, but you should teach Markowitz hmm? and then, for instance, ask the question when Harry Markowitz invested his own money, mm -hmm. did he use his theory? The answer is no. <laughs> he used a simple heuristic. Exactly. Then explain what it is. It's 1 over n. Yeah? invest equal in the end assets. You know? so and then the you students. are in the middle of this. Then your students have understood Markowitz. One over N is not difficult to understand. Hmm? And then the real question is, which is better and where? Hmm? And then you are in the middle. And the same do this with Merton, hmm? who, unlike Markowitz, followed his theory and went punk. Hmm? Yes. Hmm? And then you ask, so why did he do? Why did this happen there? So and then you're in the middle then, and then you also have students who have, are forced to think. So that that would be my my, my solution to that. And of right. course, uh, the students need to understand the conventional theory and more. 
can i make a quick point it's yeah i think we have to enough. get back to societal challenges but you can make a quick comment okay. yeah. very good one so it's a very in interesting interview by markowitz and peter tanos so peter asked him so professor markowitz you want the nobel for this how do you where do, how do you make investments he said i put all of my investments in bonds <laughs> but didn't you say you have to do all this portfolio he said yeah but i don't i'm not doing it i'm investing everything <laughs> in bonds Okay, I, I really want to break this down to how, uh, I, I know Biju said that, you know, behavioral sciences, it will work perhaps over a longer term, but you can't immediately change mindset. But I also want to get some insights on how you are making a start in that area. And uh, Professor Kar, I want to start with you, uh, because you are sort of working with doctors, you're working with patients to help them understand medical risks using behavioral sciences. And, you know, health is a huge uh, challenge in India as well. So, uh, you know, take us through your learning so far and, you know, if it can be applied in an Indian context. Um, I can tell you what we did in Germany and European countries and in part in the US. I cannot really answer the question whether it can be uh, applied to India. Mm -hmm. You need to answer that. Okay. So, uh, give you two examples. The um, first, what you need to realize is that uh, medical students in Europe, in the US, do, they learn lots of things, but they don't learn one thing, is, which is thinking. <laughs> thinking with numbers. So health statistics. We have done studies on doctors and medical students in the US, in Germany, and roughly 80% of doctors do not understand health statistics. AT, hmm? that is most. That is, they're not able to read an article in their own field. And that's not a problem of the medical mind, it's lack of teaching. So, you can, I can easily fool any doctor in believing that the treatment is great or not, by just twisting the statistics. So, um, that's the, one of the key problems, there are more. So, what we have done, here are a few examples. For instance, we have uh, managed certainly in Germany, but probably uh, also more broadly, that the use of misleading statistics is now almost gone from all the brochures and pamphlets, and also in the public. That was very common 10 years ago. So, for instance, when a, a screening reduced mortality from, say, from four in thousand people who participated to three in thousand people, which means one in thousand, that was not reported like that. It was reported as a 25% reduction. And people think it's 250 or thousand. Yeah? This kind of misleading statistics, saying something that's not exactly wrong, but, uh, but betting on that people are enumerate and so on. That has been the rule. It's no longer. How did you achieve that? I have a very smart group of people one is here, and who are also courageous. And we have trained thousands of doctors. We are in the public, in the public domain. I've given endless talks to medical uh, uh, groups. And for instance, one, one tool that we use is reputation. So I've said in public, in TV, in radio, in, in great things, and I picked the largest society in Germany that is disseminates misleading, you take the biggest enemy, you don't care about the other ones, and say, this society is on its way to lose the public, the trust of the public, because they mislead you. And here is, explain you now how they're doing it. Yeah? And then, this was the, uh, this, the German, uh, the Deutsche Krebshilfe, the German Cancer Help Society. So, first, the press speaker came to me, and said, do you have anything against us? I said, no, on the contrary, I, help you. I offer you now, we help you to rewrite your brochures so that they reflect the medical evidence and they're understandable. If you don't do it, I will continue in public saying that you are on your way to lose the trust of the public. And then we will see who has more influence in this country, you or Max Planck. I didn't know. I didn't know what the answer is, but she also didn't know. And she went back to her superiors, and then they went back to
to us uh, and we helped them to rewrite the brochures. Now we are good friends <laughs> because they believe they always wanted to do this. Huh? So that's just a case story that you can do something by standing up, by going yeah, like you on TV or in other things huh? and just uh, say what's obvious. Huh? For instance, um, you will hear in a few days uh, by Michelle about what's going on in South India. It's the thyroid cancer pandemic. Huh? And it is uh, probably the same crime as it happened in Korea. Mm -hmm. Thyroid cancer screening should not be done. It has no positive effect. It has only harm. 10% of Indians have thyroid cancer. You will never notice this because it doesn't do anything. It's clinically irrelevant. But if you go screening, it will be detected, it will be operated, and you will be a patient for the rest of your life. <laughs> and in heart. Huh? So these kind of things are going on. And this is why risk literacy is so important hmm, that you understand what others try to do with you hmm, instead of blindly falling prey to a commercial system. Hmm. Yeah. So that's uh, examples of what you can do in the in the medical, it's just one last example from that, from that part. So the German Chancellery has, uh, a few years ago, set up a team that advises the Chancellery in getting scientific informed huh, politics. Mm -hmm. And it's not a nudging team. In contrary, they want to make the people competent. In Germany, we don't like nudging because we want to have educated citizens. And what they're doing is, so one problem is that so many people die in hospitals because of hygiene problems, right. hand washing. How do you get doctors to hand wash? If you want to nudge them and make a face or something, or send them letters, that doesn't work. And the problem is rather that the doctors think that they are not the problem, it's the nurses. And then if you talk with the nurses, they say, it's not us, it's the doctors, they never wash hands. Mm -hmm. And so, so in that case, to make it short, they set up a program, a program and they put the hygiene expert who was previously sitting in her office doing statistics, instead going out and changing something, mm -hmm. sending her out, documenting who is washing, who is not. And then everyone realized that everyone is part of the problem. Then they themselves got together and developed a scheme where they can reduce this problem. And these are solutions which not only decreased the incidences, but are much more likely to be sustainable because they are part of the culture. Whereas nudging politics are always from someone else. And the moment you, you, you get out here, then it's probably gone. So these are a few examples where you can change things. And that goes actually quickly. And many of these things could be done much more quickly. It may be too that it takes longer, as you fear. But in principle, we couldn't do it. If we would have just more people who uh, go out and have a certain joy in changing the world. Right. Um, Kansan, your own uh, you know, experience in using uh, behavioral science in solving a real world problem. Can, can you give us some insights on that? Well, some of the things we have done involve actually a long-standing problem between the Max Planck and the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. I forget now if it was mentioned in this discussion or some of the discussions before, so I'm going to repeat it. So uh, a few years ago, the governor of the Bank of England approached Gerd and uh, they started talking and then we started a collaboration which has been going on for a while. It culminated in a very interesting uh, uh, speech by Andy Halden, who is the chief economist of the bank. And uh, you can already anticipate that it's a nice speech because the title is The Dog and the Frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'll leave it at that. So that may, may motivate you to read it. So in short, what we're doing, we're trying to give to the regulators some models that are very simple to interpret, they're transparent. Mm. Because their problem and their motivation for rejecting scientific evidence, it's sometimes the scientific evidence looks 
too uh, precise to be credible. So if you're able, for somehow, for example, if a, a model outputs a probability of 73.51% that this bank will fail, almost every reasonable person will start saying this cannot be. And especially if you don't even explain to them how you got to that 73.51%. So something of what we did was to create uh, graphical, transparent models. Mm -hmm. And the Bank of England is a powerful organization. So uh, some of our contacts there are able and are asked continuously to go out and speak to the major stakeholders, which include regulators, they include the politicians, which basically want to understand something in plain English, they prefer to understand potentially less, but understand it well, rather than to, to, to have to take a leap of faith and to accept an authority that is really far from the personal experience. So it seems that this is a good beginning mm. to put in this kind of uh, simple and transparent and possibly robust regulation in place. Right. Yeah. Right. So this is one example, and maybe also Madhu has something to say about the finance. Thing. But overall, uh, I agree that it will take potentially a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, if you start, I think it could be kind of a, some kind of accelerating returns, in which you realize people are actually hungry for understanding, not for uh, accepting and believing without understanding, and then pretending they understand. Mm -hmm. I think everybody wants to feel empowered rather than uh, be instructed right. what to do. Yeah. Or, or, or be in a position that uh, they simply have to accept something because otherwise they would look stupid. Mm -hmm. I think in general people don't like this. So. Right. Um, you know, you, you spoke about uh, accidents that happen uh, on railway uh, tracks and uh, uh, I, I heard an interesting story about how you came up with a solution for that. I think by using color or paint or signs. Uh, what kind of behavioral signs do you think you can use to reduce road accidents in India. That's, that's a serious, serious problem. Do you think you can take lessons from that and apply it here? Um, <clears throat> one of the guiding principles uh, that has gone about uh, our approach has been um, for the first 18, 20 years of my life, I was in the world of advertising, uh, working with all the big brands and big companies and and I realized that uh, I was part of the 90% failure rate. Mm. Um, and and as, as a search to look for understanding human decision making, I realized one thing, that our traditional theories of human behavior, which is all, you know, as we as Ramachandran of, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, California University mentioned, there are as many psychology theories as psychologists. So there is behaviorism, cognitive science, but the point is that behaviorism was thrown out of the window by cognitive science in the 50s. Cognitive science never took emotions into consideration. Psychoanalysis started off well, but completely went into a disaster. Uh, then there were individuals like Maslow and who came up with theories. But the fact that there is no one single theory that explains all aspects of human behavior has been forgotten by all practitioners and theoreticians. I mean, there's no fundamental theory. We take theories and combine it all and then hopefully we think we know, understand human behavior. But we realized that uh, from the neuroscience world that all to do with human behavior, our thoughts and actions emanate from one part of our body that's between our ears, which is the human brain. Mm -hmm. The more we understand the functioning of the human brain, which I can tell you it's very difficult because as I said before, it is the most complex system in the world we will be able to understand human behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have done for solving many of the problems that we have. Mm -hmm. So for example, to solve the problem of, you know, why people misjudge and people misjudge the speed of the train, we went back into the, into the brain and I think Heard might use it as, you know, smart heuristics. So how does the brain actually judge the speed of a large object or any object that comes towards you? But if you really look at it, you know, what is the distance between me and that particular vehicle? What speed at which the vehicle is coming towards me? What is the distance between me and the other side of the road? So what speed should I run across? Now, even if you have all these variables, will take us two minutes to do that calculation. But the brain does a very smart calculation of that speed with respect and we realize with reference points. 
And we realize the brain can only judge speed where there is a reference point. So on a flight, we don't judge the speed of a, of a train on a flight uh, because there are no reference points. So once we realize that the smart heuristics the brain uses to judge the speed of something is a, is a reference point, my design team said, okay, then how do we provide a reference point? And then they came up with an answer by saying, okay, the train is coming towards us from there. Then and there are these sleepers. So paint five sleepers in yellow, 15, leave 15 of them empty, next paint another five, because the place where people trespass is a constant figure, I mean, place. So suddenly they have blobs of about four or five yellow paints out there. And as the train comes towards you, your brain at a non-conscious level judges the speed, people stay back. And we found that over one year, the reduction in accidents was 75%. But we understood the functioning of the brain. And I think, to me, the answer to actually solve a lot of these problems is, I think we should get, neuroscience should become the centerpiece of it, of our, of our construct. The more we understand the functioning of the brain, the more we'll be able to do. And the second is, I want to bring in, neuroscience, Antonio Damasio clearly proven which none of us want to hear, that there's nothing called a rational decision, that all decisions are emotions, emotional. So one of the things our team does today is that in all decisions, we study what are the emotions that are involved there. And we use those emotions or we find an effective way to use emotions uh, to, uh, you know, to communicate what we really want to do. So for example, when you asked about how, how did we do things on the road, Road, I think we changed the signage system on the Indian roads. Mm -hmm. So if you look at from Mangalore Airport and you come towards it, <clears throat> there's a lot of English poetry written on the side. You know, speed is thrilled. Who, <laughs> who's got the time to read it? Who's got the ability to read it? But we said if you put photographs and pictures of, there's something called future seeing. The brain is always predicting. His brain is not, it's an input, it's not an input output machine. So we put the picture of a possible accident that could happen to you. But we again took learnings from, because we realized that the people who really understood the science is not just the scientists like us. The organized religion and the politicians knew the science long, long back. And those from India would know one thing, if you heard the communist, inkulab, 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 sindabad. They say it only three times. You never heard them saying two times or four times. But when we look deeper, you realize that the Christianity has three gods, Hinduism also has three gods. There is a construct of a three which is very, very powerful. So what we did, for example, in our roads, signages, is the signages, we did it in three. So far across the world, all signages have been one. And that too, graph, you know, words and other things. We said, bring pictures. So these and more are some of the ways we brought in interventions. And I think the reduction, now we're working on the 15th highway in India. Mm -hmm. The reductions on road accidents are close to 40% over one year, over a long period of time. Because of just a change in signage and minor changes on you know, road, like again, to give a speed reference across there. There are no words, there are no, uh, you know, the typical conscious communication. We call it uh, designing for the non-conscious. And these are all things that works at a non-conscious level and we have managed to actually find, uh, get the people to behave. And we are a market, you know, we always said we are a, not a peer-reviewed company, we are a market-reviewed company. We, we, we look for the results. We put it for six months. We took it for one year. And then we look and say, has the accident rate come down? And then if it has come down, we've done a good job. If it hasn't come down, we've bad, done a bad job. And we don't publish papers. <laughs> Neither do we get a high from there, that's the point. <coughs> we don't get at all a high from publishing a paper in some, some publication is not what we are interested in. We are interested in actually solving the problems of the world. Does, does that help, uh, Professor Gad, you know, including some elements of nudge to... <laughs> now, um, the putting up signs is a good idea, and maybe three is better than one, yes. Hmm. The, uh, <clears throat> so if it's the debate about nudging, so <laughs> then we need first to be clear what nudging is. Hmm. So nudging by Sale and Sunstein is 
be supposed to be something new. Hmm? Mm. So it cannot be incentives. That they say very clear. It's not incentives. Hmm? It's also not education. Hmm? Because they start from the assumption that we are all somehow irrational. Hmm? Mm. And also there's no hope for you. Hmm? Because yeah. <laughs> allegedly uh, science has shown that uh, these biases don't go away. Hmm? Which is, by the way, not true. Psychology knows since long how to make them going away. It's just that Richard Saylor doesn't read that part of psychology. And uh, the, so nudging is basically the assumption that uh, so one uses the techniques that are known from marketing, mm -hmm. from advertising, and also from the design of everyday things. So ergonomics, whatever. Hmm? Uh, so there's no new technique in nudging. So that's, it's not really methods of behavioral sciences. So they use the old uh, methods and now the idea is the government should use them because, as I said, we are irrational. There's no hope for us. Therefore, the, the government needs to step in. That's the most clearest way to. Mm -hmm. And step in in a way so that people are not forced. They still have the choice, but one uses the so-called cognitive biases so that it turns for the best to the people. The problem is that the best to the people is also dictated by someone above. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> because one can, according to the theory, one cannot ask you what you really want in your life because you are subject to framing errors and everything. And however you ask you, something different comes out. That's the key thing. Yeah. So all this is not my philosophy hmm? because uh, this is a form of paternalism, soft paternalism. And at least in Western Europe, we had had enough paternalism in the last century. Hmm? The hard kind, the soft kind, whatever. What we need are risk literate people. So people who are not steered along like sheep, but people who learn, and that may take some time, hmm? to take their own lives in their hands and become responsible citizens. And that's a much bigger project. Yeah. And the, uh, the key problems are about the nudging methodology. So take the problem in many Western countries, children are too fat, obese. And so, and the nudging philosophy, what do they do? Now, yeah, you may put the apples, this is typical examples, in the cafeteria at the eye level of children that's the solution. There's a study, this was always a story, huh? never any study. The first study I've read, they have put the, at the eye level, children are much smarter, they go down. <laughs> <laughs> so it has no effect. So some nudging thing has some effect, they're always typically very small. And the question is whether they're ever sustainable if the nudges go away. So uh, that's one could do, the House of Lords has complained about that because, so the Cameron, this then Cameron government, they established the first nudging group. And the, um, and, uh, the House of Lords has reviewed, has found there's little evidence that this method really works. And the problem is that, as they think, the government is misusing the nudge people in order to avoid being tough on industry that sells unhealthy products to children in these examples. So instead of this, so the government has this nudge team, they can do some things, yeah, and so we have no problem with the, with real uh, protecting children. So that's, that's one of the key problems. And the alternative uh, is really, as I think, to do things so that people, not just children, understand their world better and are also more willing to take over responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's not very hard. Mm -hmm. That should start in school, mm -hmm. educate children, make them risk literate in finance, how to deal with money. Mm -hmm. Make them risk literate in health, how to lead a healthy life and how to recognize what's wrong for you. Or in, in the digital world, so how to control your smartphone rather than being controlled by it. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And that also means at the end to take the remote control for your own emotions 
back in your own hands. And we could do all of that. And part of this is now happening, particularly in the digital world, it has become clear, <coughs> particularly in the US, that more and more children, uh, they, children that grew up as digital natives and check their uh, smartphone maybe all five minutes because they don't want to be out of their social group mm -hmm. and it's expected. These children report that they are more lonely than the generations before, although they're constantly networked, mm -hmm. but they really feel lonely. They may be maybe at home, yeah, at the, in the bed, hmm, and doing their social contacts with other people. They are also more depressed as the generations before and more anxious. On the positive side, these children have fewer accidents, traffic accidents, because they <laughs> spend so much time at home. Uh, teenage pregnancy has gone down in the US. Yeah, that's all on the positive side. Yeah. And uh, although suicides have gone up. Mm -hmm. So uh, all these things we could address and actually do something about. And that's I was just where coming to that. Science. How can behavioral sciences really help in curing social media addiction? Because it's almost like Facebook and Twitter nudge you to keep using. Yeah. 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 Uh, at the moment, uh, there, there are already organizations who are, according to the last uh, news reports, forcing or trying to force Apple to install software where parents can control the time <laughs> <laughs> children spend with that. So this is regulation. That's not so much mm. behavioral mm. science, but that's uh, one method. The other one would be to start early, say in first grade. Hmm? So before they became really addicted. And with teachers who are models, who can show they put their smartphone aside, even close it down hmm? mm. for an hour, and, and explain children how to control the thing. And also not to be so dependent from the others. You know? The yeah. problem is that they control themselves in their group. Mm. So there are a number of methods. And there could even be some insights from neuroscience be helpful. Mm. What's happening to the brains of these children? We have a few studies that indicate that attention spans are being lost. Mm. That mm. is. Uh, I have a few researchers in my own group hmm, <laughs> whose attention span is lost. Hmm. Are they in this room? <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, and who, who are constantly, you can just see this. You're in a meeting, you discuss some paper, and you can see that paper's hand, the person's hand is getting uneasy and has to go to the smartphone and check something. And when I ask, is there something important? There's always something very important on it. <laughs> it could be an acceptance of paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it's addiction. On, on Facebook. <laughs> it's addiction, yeah. And these are not good models. We have studies that show that mothers more and more do not pay attention to their children. That also holds for fathers, but the studies were for mothers. Huh? And uh, a child needs to uh, learn emotions, to understand people, needs eye contact, needs someone who talks mm. to you. Hmm? Mm. And if you have a mother who is constantly in her social network and checking and checking and checking, mm. uh, and sometimes looking to the child, then it appears that children uh, have attention deficits, they lack emotional development, they can no longer read other people's faces. They only can read if, when they're a little bit older, if you have sent a, uh, a text message and there is an emotion icon, oh yeah, yeah, that they can understand, but no longer so what they can only read emoticons, not emotions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we can do something about it, and we need to do something soon. Mm. Right. In, in fact, that was going to be the last part. I, in terms of what behavioral sciences can do in, in tech. Yeah. yeah, so I was just thinking about uh, one of the, I'm a fin guy obviously, so we have a serious problem with the society, the reputation of finance. Uh, I'm actually in conversation with Kavita, we were discussing some ideas about working closely with mutual fund managers, brokers, rating agencies for instance, 
should really go back to the crisis and see how people have read contracts hmm. and haven't really understood the content in the contract and merely signed the contracts. For example, you take a loan from the bank and you just sign without reading anything because the brokers told you what to do. So there's a lot of stuff that can be done at this level and I'm sure there's very little done in India, for instance. So um, I'm thinking of just talking to Gerd and Kavitha and other people to see, could we really do something interesting with this sort of, you know, A, uh, rating agencies if possible, uh, you know, institutional investors, brokers, mutual fund managers, because these are, there are a lot of people who absolutely hand over their wealth to these people, mm. right? And for me, the biggest societal challenge is another crisis, which is not too far away. And every time you have a crisis, you say, but it's different this time. It's a different crisis this time. How can it be different? So we have to be extremely careful and understanding human brain is definitely not easy. And Biju has really pointed that very nicely. But, but I guess there's got to be a very close connection between, this is why I like uh, Andrew Lowe's work, which I was discussing with Gerd and Bubble Double Finance and Trouble, where Andrew talks about drawing a lot from evolutionary biology. And I think that sort of connection between biologists, physicists, mathematicians, neuroscientists, economists, we have to really, really work together. I think research, and I get a lot of high, um, Biju, by getting papers in, um, so I have to give the back to you. But, uh, but having said that, I think this sort of multidisciplinary research, which is really what Max Planck, I'm sure, also actively promotes, is really the way to go. Because there are a million problems in finance that we have not been able to solve. For example, literacy, financial literacy, Investor sophistication, how literate are the investors today? There are architects, there are doctors. Are, they, are you telling me that they understand the markets? They understand what's a stock, what's a bond, what's a dividend, what's a coupon? May not be because they're saying, well, I'm just giving money to my broker and he's just going to go and invest. Right. So from, for me, looking at either um, a Kahnemanian type of you know, cognitive biases, understanding them using that sort of approach, to really deal with these sorts of problems so we can understand and maybe awareness of the problem is actually the beginning mm. and most of us are not aware of what the problem is and that's largely why you're having the 1929 then the 87 then you have this 2001 then you have 2008 and the US hasn't even recovered yet and I'm sure there's another crisis not far away right. because of aspiration serious aspiration to own properties and stuff that without understanding what the asset is about not knowing what contracts we're signing, and, and the education is abysmal. Right. So, so I hope you know that's something we're able to work with, good and others, and, and maybe you know help solve some of the problems. Right. Closing comments from both of you. Uh, I think I also want to remind that uh, behavioral sciences is 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 obviously for us to reach as um, you know potential. Uh, a few more things will have to be done. We'll have to convert those into processes. For example, um, you know, the market, it, it, it take all GERD's, you know, understanding and all his theories and we understand, but we go and use a traditional questionnaire method or a focus groups to understand, you know, it completely go wrong. I think one of the things we have worked on was actually then realized if that's so, we need to read develop a new market research technique because the market research techniques that we have are based on the traditional rational man. That means I can put certain things and I can put, you know, whatever feelings onto a Likert scale, which is rationality at the highest level. How can we use that research methodology to understand Gertz uh, theories? The second is all our communication strategies have been the mass media, the 30-second commercial as the epitome of dealing with human behavior. Now, one of the most important facets about behavior change is context matters. And unless, the more you go far away, and Gerd has written several times about the importance of context, which behavioral economics and others have forgotten, but context is very, very important. So if you want to change behavior, be at the point of action, which means we have to develop new mediums of, of communication beyond the 30-second commercial and the front pages of newspapers. And which means that, you know, it's just not enough that we study their theories. We need to work much harder. We need to change processes. We need to change uh, new mediums. We need to create a lot of things. Only then we will get the benefits of the work of all these great uh, behavioral scientists. 
I actually agree with everything that was said lately. Something I would, I would add on the nudge, I think it's clear that it should be morally uh, kind of unacceptable. <laughs> and I think we really went uh, a long way in establishing some set of values, accepting sometimes some losses in performance or efficiency, because we understand that in the long term we're not going to survive if we don't have some values. And because we started accumulating values and knowledge and priorities and so on and so forth, we established an educational system which of course has its flaws. But it's, in my mind, somehow it's clear, it's the only reliable way to move forward all together as a right. species, if right. you want. And in the long run, actually, it will be more efficient and it will lead to better performance. So sometimes I'm surprised that some people think it will make more sense to just follow every little guy that wants to eat more burgers mm -hmm. and try to make them you know, eat, eat more vegetables, rather than going back to, to babies and children and instilling values and critical thinking about everything, about the literature, about thinking with numbers, about caring about people who are killing themselves. I just don't think this ad hoc patchwork of about a billion nudges that we would need mm. can ever replace what we build over actually uh, thousands of years, which is a system that accumulated because it helped us have a better life. So I would just end up by saying, you know, we should always try to, to, to educate ourselves and educate others as exactly we're doing in Tap Me Now. So, you know, right, you know. great. Oh, no, I'm going to take some questions. Okay, I see the first hand going up. There. Um, so, my question is uh, about the selling the cigarettes and all, and then also in um, the cigarette packets and all. Even then, I find people are getting quite adapted to it, and they, they just ignore the images. They don't even look at it. So what could be your comments on this? Um, I think you're right. Um, the people who worked on the cigarette packaging um, it doesn't know neuroscience. One of the most important facet about neuroscience says uh, there's one thing our brain can't do. Our brain cannot visualize our death. And, and our brain, although it's the biggest reality, our brain on a regular basis denies our, the fact that if I think that I'm going to die tomorrow, I'm not going to have this discussion right now. I would be with my wife and my daughter right now. But I think the brain constantly denies our death. So just try, even in our dreams, when we try to fall down and when we're about to hit the floor, we'll wake up. And that means every time you see someone dead, that's always you, not me. So we knew that and that's why we never show a dead man in any of our, our, our signages. But there are certain other signages and I don't have time, if I had seen tomorrow's talk, I will show some of those images. Those images are completely where there's a certain amount of fear is being created but not death right cigarette I, I think cigarette companies are very happy when people ask them to go gorier and gorier pictures because the most important facet of communications relatability that could happen to me the more you put death and gorier pictures that's not me that's what they're able to hold those pictures in their hand and still smoke but our studies have shown when people go past our, our signages, people reduce the speed of their cars from 20% to 50% in, in, in a certain period, you know, distance across. So our speed gun studies are clearly showing that our signages are actually making people slow down as they go past that particular thing. So it all depends on understanding the neuroscience of images too. If you don't understand, you will make a mistake, as the cigarette companies have done which they're happy with. So if that's the case, why yeah, do they, they want the images to move? Actually, a lot of people haven't understood this behavioral sciences. The judges, you know, the, 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 the policy makers haven't understood. So they think showing gorier and gorier pictures is good, which it is not. The cigarette companies are very happy that, you know, 
that final when a companies are not, the government has not asked final mile to work on those images if final mile well was asked to work on those images we will work on a very different image which will make them not pick that cigarette and smoke yeah. i think the uh, evolutionary theory would tell you that death images don't work what works is something different yeah. women want to be beautiful men want to be potent yeah. so put pictures there on impotence put pictures there on ugly skin yeah? that is much more effective than death yeah? second I remark completely the, agree with you. the the example of smoking is in general not a good example for rationality irrationality because smoking unless many other behaviors is addictive these people are physiologically yes. addicted and it's, it's like heroin. Huh? The real psychological question is how it gets there. Huh? But to stop smoking is really different. So in Germany, the figures are among those who quit smoking within one year, 90% are back. It's very difficult. Huh? Even if it's no longer socially respected in the US or in <coughs> Germany. So this is why it's not a good example. And, the, and the, it's well known, Robert Proctor has written uh, a number of books, Robert Proctor, he's a, and on uh, what he went into the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tobacco companies into their files, which is now legal in the US, and just shown how they have been lying to everyone and how they have been putting uh, addictive substances that are not really needed just to get you hooked on that. That's the real point. This is not really about biases in, in people's minds. It's about the industry who, who makes sure that you will be a lifelong customer. Absolutely. Yeah. And that we need to, to go on. Yeah? And that probably is, can be partly gone. So if I think you could save a few young people, not everyone, because the industry is very powerful, by having very early, before puberty, before they start, uh, let them touch and look at a smoker's lung. Have you ever seen one? Bon appetit. <laughs> <laughs> and these kind of things can really uh, help you to do this. And so uh, the, the, the images may work, but they are, they're still of the wrong kind. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to add a quick point about the smoking stuff. So um, obviously we know it's bad, but I'm sure the guy who's smoking probably has known some hundreds of people who smoked their entire life, and they have nothing has happened to them. So he thinks, well, they're not dead, they're 90 plus, they're still f smoking around, I also won't die. So that's absolutely possible. In fact, Nick Barberis talks about it in his, in his one of his papers. Although the, uh, just to give some facts in, the, the estimated life expectancy that you lose if you're a heavy smoker is about 10 years. There's nothing, so if you smoke, you don't have to worry about any health behavior, nothing. Going to doctor or not doesn't matter compared to all of that. <laughs> That's also a way to look at it. And also, by the way, we talked about that before. Uh, if you use the term rational in smoking, <laughs> then according to the standard economic theory, like or decision theory that defines rationality by, by content-free axioms of consistency, there's nothing rational there's nothing irrational about smoking. Notice that. And, and also, if you define classical uh, rationality over utility maximization, there's nothing irrational about smoking. It's just your utility. Utility is an empty concept. You can justify any behavior after the fact. Yeah? So we mean a different kind of rationality with that. Uh, again, goes to uh, Vichu, sir. Um, so we're talking about societal changes, right? So what are you saying as you're bringing in or introducing policies and practices to basically bring in the changes? And the policies and practices are designed with behavioral models or behavioral science. Um, but the biggest question I have is the sustainability of these practices and policies. Um, we have seen pollution hitting its rock high in Delhi. 
the plastic that's being trashed all over in India. We have garbage everywhere. Um, the thought process of green energy usage is we started, we want solar revolution. All these things are policies or practices that's been introduced with certain amount of behavioral study behind it. But uh, we have seen that sustainability is not being hit with these societal changes. And why do you think these are um, uh, problems? What is the fundamental problem with this? Uh, per se, but sustainability? Yeah. Sustainability would actually be the mother of all behavior problems. Um, so much so there is that very interesting book called uh, how our brain can't, I think George Marshall's book, I think he's written uh, large, this one's about why is this the mother of all problems. One, um, because uh, bystander apathy, because you know, when I can't see, I think I've written a fair bit about it. The most interesting is New York Times actually went to Karibathi Islands in Pacific Oceans. And the, what is interesting about Karibathi Islands is when the temperature goes up to that 2% that 2 degrees that we're talking about, that's the first landmass that is going to go underwater. And so much so they have actually bought 900 or 9,000 acres of land in Fiji Islands about a few, you know, thousand kilometers away. They've asked all these people to move to Fiji Islands. And what are the people of Karibathi Islands said? God has created us. God has kept us in this island. Nothing will happen to us. That means the people at the epicenter of that particular problem can't visualize that this particular problem can happen to us. So our brain is not really geared up to actually foresee problems, you know, that could happen. That's one. But one of the big issues that I find is from the issue of empathy. Because we are talking about four generations later, something will happen in the world. Let me ask one thing to you. If both of, and I worked on some organizational behavior projects, we realized that those departments that deal with the customers on a face, uh, daily basis, they are actually very empathetic to the, uh, to the consumer. But those departments who sit just a, a, a wall away and don't interact with the customers on a regular basis, their empathy levels with the customers are far lower. Which means that I might be empathetic to my daughter, I might be a bit okay with my granddaughter or grandchildren, I don't even really visualize. Just, am I, do I even think of my grandchild's child? If I don't even think of them, how will I ever think of creating a future which is really for them? Which means the whole facet of empathy, which is at the cornerstone of sustainability and preparing myself for a future, is not an easy thing to develop in the people. So, uh, you make, you're making this as a common man's problem, right? Uh, as an individual, I will have to look for sustainability four generations down. Um, I want to take a case of plastics, um, both in Kerala or in Karnataka, where all the shops are not supposed to offer plastic bags, right? Um, the, that has been working very well because now you do see people not carry black bags and white plastic bags getting crashed into their home. But the corporates which are still selling these Haldirams, the Lays and all those things are still available in the market. People buy it, just throw it on the road. So the problem is it's not a common man's problem. The behavior, you have addressed the behavior of the common man, but the behavior of the organization has not been addressed. So the sustainability factor here is not about the common man, but the, behavior, uh, the change has to happen on a different level. So um, these policies, what we are defining, how do we define, how do you basically um, strategize them and where do you want to put these policies? How do you look at sustainability for these policies? Oh, we actually, uh, for most of these social problems, we use the word called wicked problems. Wicked because the set of people who are involved in, as you rightly said, plastic problem is, is common man is involved, there are the shopkeepers who are involved, there are the manufacturers who are some of the big, you know, players, so this, they are involved there. So there are multiple people who are involved there. We are also realizing that a lot of problems are not very simple where the problem, like open defecation for example, is not about just getting people to use the toilets. But there are a lot of sub-problems that emanate from there, not washing the hands, their, their pits getting filled up. So all problems are complex. And sustainability is also very complex with multiple players involved, with multiple legs to that particular problem. So, so much so we don't use the word solve today. We use the word mitigate. Because we are realizing uh, it's, 
corruptions and these are all very complex problems and we all expect that we would all solve and make this country now no we'll only solve certain legs of it in certain places one by one and that's the that's the reality and we need to take each of those problems in those particular uh, you know timelines i think the person who asked the question uh, also wants to mon the point it's not just the individual brain who is something doing wrong but there is a lack of government uh, seriousness and that has probably i don't know uh, in the Western country, it usually has to do with in impact of industry. Hmm? And that could be well be here. Hmm? So this is not just a problem of individual minds, but also a government who is weak on industry. Hmm? For instance, uh, uh, the, you have a huge pollution problem here in India, in particularly in Delhi, but also in other places. And already higher numbers of uh, particle emission in, in, uh, in Delhi than in uh, your competitor, Beijing, <laughs> you topped it. <laughs> and, and why is nothing being done about that? For instance, England had a huge pollution problem long time ago, and they did something about it. It's gone. Uh, Germany had a problem with plastics. It's gone. For instance, they, at some places, they're just... Um, so people used to go to a supermarket and, and buy things and ask for a, a plastic bag. You know? They still can ask for a plastic bag, but it costs a euro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, simple. Mm -hmm. Then you bring your own plastic bag, at least the, the number of plastic bags is reduced. And so, so measurements can be done. And I guess that these measurements need to be done on a regulatory level and not on an individual level. So Mark Twain uh, once said, uh, history never repeats itself. But it often rhymes. But every time when the market crashes, so we say this time it's different. So why does the predictability become so hard? Sure. <laughs> the only Finn guy. <laughs> so are you saying why does predictability become so hard? That's why I said, you know, in my closing remarks, that every time we say that of, there is, it's about the bubble stuff, right? So bubbles. Uh, are basically when there's a serious appreciation and then there's a quick down. So asset prices are, are, are kind of, unfortunately, they go high very fast. And every time this happens, the markets say it's different this time because that is, it's impossible to predict how it's going to be. And one thing we can say is we are predictably irrational, but we can never predict. I mean, in fact, Raghurajam actually pointed out in fault lines that there is going to be a sort of a crisis. But every crisis is different. And every, you cannot sit and predict a crisis because that is just impossible. No complex models can sit and you can capture every possible variable and say this is what's going to happen. It is, it's almost impossible to capture that. And also we know some things that, so in my view, uh, I agree totally the next crisis can happen. Yeah. We don't know. It may don't not happen. We may be lucky. Uh, uh, and one of the reasons are that uh, policymakers, and banking industry have not been willing hmm, to get tough yeah. on regulations. They have implemented regulations that are mostly useless, in my opinion. Hmm. So, for instance, what still is intact, the rating agencies mm. are still paid by the Absolutely. bank. Absolutely. Ah, what a model is, it's like you are a teacher, hmm, and your students, they select the teacher hmm, whom, they, whom they pay. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so there's, uh, so there's no, no regulation on there. The banks are still bigger than ever before. Over leverage. Hmm? They are more connected than ever before. And the, yeah, there's a little bit uh, push on the dangerous uh, yeah, uh, financial inventions. Innovations. <laughs> Innovations, so you just, yeah. You just take two examples. <laughs> S&P, yeah. when the 2008 crisis happened, they decided they didn't want to lose business. So they were willing to give ratings even to companies they should never have given, yeah. right? Goldman Sachs, the CEO said, I don't care what you do, I want the business to go up. Merrill Lynch did exactly the same. AAG did exactly the same. Even Lewis did exactly the same. But that's why I said the other day, if you had Lehman Sisters, maybe it would have been different. <laughs> yeah. It's like doing, having soccer games where the referee is paid by the 
Yeah. Soccer teams. <laughs> and which one pays more? Eh? What do you expect? So this is also a failure of uh, the governments to act in at who are basically in in the in double with, with the banks. Mm. So I wouldn't call this predictably irrational in terms of mm. people. Yeah? It's often they blame the people are so stupid. Yeah? And, but this is really a matter of, of government here. Mm. So um, the joke going around on Twitter among academics is that uh, I can get 70,000 new followers by just adding blockchain on my uh, <laughs> profile. So I'll lead in with that. Uh, so is the blockchain the next uh, downfall of the uh, economy? And how are people, sir, uh, to you, Professor Guy Grins, uh, how are people uh, cognitively latching onto something like the blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin, which does not have a sovereign backing? Uh, so how are people, uh, how are people sort of cognitively adapting to something like that? So uh, I personally don't use Twitter <laughs> because I want to have time for thinking and research. <laughs> Just to make clear my own position, I also have my, uh, my iPhone uh, most of the time totally shut off because otherwise I would be bombarded and it would end up like a person who has problems with association <laughs> and thinking. Eh? And so. This is my way I protect myself against that. And I said before, the, uh, the entire consequences of the digital revolution is not well understood. There's amazingly little research. For instance, there was a, an article in the American Psychologist by a group of psychologists who study the impact of the digital realization on people's attention span, on their emotions, on their social life and so on. And they reported that they were just on a conference on young people's social life, a several day conference, not a single talk on social media. Can you imagine that? In the US. There's just sleeping research, educational research. There's very little publication about that. It's only starting now. So what we would need to do to answer your question and the other question is to do serious research. On, and it's a challenge how to do this research. And that could be also something you could do here. So the TAPMI uh, analysis of the consequences of digital life, hmm? and that would be very interesting. And it certainly uh, affects not only uh, the world of finance, you know, because we're, we're, this is the algorithm part of what, what will happen if everyone has the same algorithm. Then? <laughs> And the stopping rule, and but also your own attention span in your children's lives, and how protect them, and that, that's something we should face. There's a uh, so interesting area, huh? much more interesting in my opinion than game theory. <laughs> that's too simple. Game theory, everything is certain. Huh? <laughs> so study the real world, huh? and the games played there. Ooh. I wouldn't be able to predict it. Is it a bubble? Um, yeah. Yeah. Everyone rushing to buy is just fear of missing out. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but I'm not sure whether it's going to be the next downfall of the economy. But definitely, it's something that that I would be very worried about, for sure. Um, in fact, the U.S. If you look at since the 2008, they haven't even recovered yet, right? I mean, if you if you probably or a crisis watcher and you plot the crisis that happens every 10, 15 years, probably one that's about to happen the next year, right? But that said, um, I'm not so sure whether Bitcoin would, would be the result, but, but there is certainly something that's very serious that's, that, that is to happen. And there's a lot of you know, uh, lack of understanding and there's absolutely no research. And people just rush into buying things without knowing what the product is. And that is where the problem is. So why do you think bubbles happen, right? And there's a very interesting paper by, um, you know, Harrison Hong at Princeton called Quiet Bubbles, Speculative Bubbles. 
So read the paper on bubbles. It's a really interesting paper on how he documents the types of bubbles and the five problems or the five insights he gives into understanding bubbles. Uh, it's a mania, right? So definitely likely to happen. 